Story 1. The Previous Tenant Two years ago, when I hit 28, I decided I had enough of apartment living. I lived in one of those high-rise buildings in the city, the kind where you can hear your neighbor's TV through the walls, the hum of elevators, and every conversation in the hallway. I really wanted some space, peace, and a bit of greenery, to be honest. So I started searching for a house that I could rent, something on the outskirts of the city, away from the rush and daily chaos. With surprisingly little work, I found a nice place. It was a simple brick house, nestled in a small community, with a porch that overlooked a tree-lined street. The backyard was a decent size, with a shed and some overgrown bushes. The inside needed a little TLC, but I saw potential. The price was within my budget, so I took the plunge. Moving day was a blur. Boxes everywhere, friends helping out, things misplaced, things missing, things broken. By evening, my new home started to take shape. The living room had my old couch facing the TV, the kitchen had my mom's hand-me-down pots and pans, and the bedroom had my bed set up, with the window overlooking the street. I remember that first night pretty well. After everyone left, I decided to hit the sack early. I knew I had a lot to do the next day, so I wanted to get some rest. I switched off the lights, and a soft glow from the street light outside came into my room. As I was drifting off, I thought I saw a shadow move across my window. I sat up, heart racing a bit, and looked out. The street was deserted. Probably just my imagination, I thought. I chalked it up to just being in a new, unfamiliar house, and the creepiness that comes with that. The next day was all about settling in. I organized, took frequent breaks, kicked back on the couch, and even threw back a beer or two. That's when I first noticed it this old blue sedan with dark tinted windows. It drove past my house slowly, didn't think much of it at first, but then I saw it again, doing another round, and again. I felt this nagging feeling at the back of my mind, something wasn't right. On its fourth round, I decided to make my presence known. I stepped out onto the porch, making it obvious that I was watching. The car didn't stop, but it definitely sped up. Night came and I was exhausted from all the day's work. I double-checked all the locks, something I picked up from living in the city, and went to bed. I don't know what time it was, but I was jolted awake by a loud banging on the front door. Someone was outside. It sounded like they were pissed, and they were shouting, This is my house! Get out! I went from dead asleep to trying to process unhinged chaos in a matter of seconds. My heart was absolutely pounding. Every worst-case scenario I'd ever imagined was playing out in my mind. Before I could even reach my phone, there were more bangs. Louder and more violent. Get out now! The voice screamed. In a frantic rush, I grabbed my phone from the bedside table. My hands were shaking as I dialed 911. With what little courage I could muster up, I shouted back, The police are on their way! The banging stopped abruptly. I rushed to the front window and peeked through the blinds. As I did, I saw a figure sprinting towards that familiar blue sedan. The person hopped into the driver's seat and sped away. The cops came, took a statement, and did a sweep of the area. One of the officers recognized the description of the car and the man. Turns out, he was the previous tenant, evicted due to unpaid rents and multiple disagreements with the landlord. He disappeared for a while, leaving behind his belongings. The landlord eventually cleared out his stuff, and when the man returned, he was not happy about it. The tenant put the house up for rent, and I was the first tenant since. The next week or two was uneasy. Every noise at night and every car that passed by put me on edge. But as weeks turned into months, the fear subsided. The old blue sedan was nowhere to be seen, and the previous tenant never showed up again. Life got into a rhythm, and I even got a dog. Other than those first two nights, my stay here at this house has been everything I wanted. I marked that second night as a one-off event, but still, it was easily one of the most terrifying nights of my life. Story 2. Something was in the walls. At 25, I thought I had my life somewhat figured out. I'd just landed a decent job in a new town, and I was buzzing with the excitement of starting fresh. The town had this quiet charm to it, a mix of suburban homes, and local businesses. I had a friend that lived in that town in a one-bedroom apartment. 
he let me crash on his couch while I worked away trying to find a place to live. After a bit of hunting, I settled on a rental house that seemed perfect for my needs. Before I signed the lease, the landlord, an older gentleman with a stern face and graying hair, shared a tidbit that gave me pause. The previous tenant had been evicted for dealing drugs out of the house. He made it sound like everything happened pretty quickly. The previous guy was out, and I took over the place soon after. I appreciated his honesty, but it made me uneasy. Still, the place was great for the price, and I convinced myself that whatever had gone down before was none of my business. The first few days went smoothly. I explored the town, found a nice local gym, and even a coffee shop that made an impressive cappuccino. The house felt like home, and I was settling in well. Everything seemed pretty normal for the first few days. I got into a routine. Work, gym, dinner, Netflix, sleep, repeat. On the Friday of that first week, after work, I decided to stop by the local convenience store. It had this old school vibe, with neon lights and a bell that jingled every time the door opened. As I picked out a bag of chips, I could see someone approaching me out of the corner of my eye. Turning around, I was met by this huge guy. He was at least six and a half feet tall, with broad shoulders and an intense look. He shot me a wide grin, introducing himself as Jake. He seemed overly friendly. His laugh was deep and echoed in the store, and he patted my back a bit too hard as we chatted. He asked about where I was from, what I did, the usual small talk. But then he suddenly invited me to play some pool at a local club that night. I wasn't too keen on the idea, so I made up a quick excuse about camping with friends that night. Uh... I said. That's actually why I'm here. I'm picking up some snacks for the trip. His eyebrows perked up a bit, as if oddly interested in that statement. Oh, so you won't be home tonight? He asked. Yeah, that's right, I responded, trying to end the conversation. The excuse seemed to work, almost a little too well. All right, man, well, have fun on your camping trip, he said. And with that, he patted me on the back one last time, abruptly turned, and walked away. Not trying to think too much into it, I finished up my shopping, paid for my things, and left. When I got home, I got a text from my buddy. Come on over and have some beers, he said. Not having anything else to do, I took him up on the offer. We talked about old times, had a few drinks, and before I knew it, it was way past midnight. He offered his couch, but I was stubborn. I had crashed on that couch one too many times already and wanted my bed. Too intoxicated to drive, I got an Uber and the last thing I remember was falling face first onto my mattress. A few hours later, I was jolted awake. My head throbbed from the alcohol, but it was unmistakable. There was glass breaking coming from the back of the house, from the back door. I heard a click, and then the creak of the door opening. In a panic, I reached for my phone, but my hand knocked it off the nightstand. I scanned the floor but couldn't find it. My head was throbbing and everything was spinning. I could hear footsteps and they were getting closer. Not being able to find my phone in the dark, I made a split decision and crawled to the closet. With the door closed, I tried to control my breathing and waited. There was nothing else that I could do. Then I began to hear large banging noises coming from the spare bedroom. I would hear a bang, then the sound of something being torn apart, and then more banging and more tearing. This repeated over and over for a few minutes, and then, just as suddenly as the noises started, they stopped. For a moment, there was an eerie silence, then hurried footsteps back towards the back of the house. I heard the back door shut, and then it was deafeningly silent. Emerging from the closet, I was met with a shocking sight. One of the walls in the back bedroom had a massive hole in it. Whoever was in my house seemed to be looking for something in the wall, and from the looks of it, they found whatever they were looking for. I finally found my phone and called the police. A thorough investigation ensued over the coming weeks, but unfortunately, the officers were unable to piece together any solid leads. They did, however, share a theory with me. They believed the previous tenant had hidden something in the walls, maybe drugs or cash. Believing that no one was home, someone broke in and retrieved whatever the items were. They questioned the previous tenant, but he played dumb. They suspected Jake from the convenience store was linked to the former tenant. Unfortunately for me, the cameras at the convenience store didn't work, so without solid evidence or even a clear identity, the police officer's hands were tied. The aftermath of that night left me shaken for a while. 
Sleepless nights followed, but eventually normalcy settled in. Reflecting on everything, I never would have guessed that there could be something hidden behind drywall and paint. I had moved to this town seeking a fresh start, but it seemed the house's past was far from behind it. Story 3 Apartment 407 Moving to the heart of the city had always been a dream for Clara and me. After months of searching, we finally settled on a nice apartment complex in the downtown area. The apartment had nice amenities like a rooftop garden, a state-of-the-art gym, and a spacious pool area. Our apartment, on the fourth floor, was a sprawling two-bedroom space with floor-to-ceiling windows and a nice view of the pool below. The floor, we were told, only had a handful of tenants. That didn't bother us much. One of those tenants, however, seemed to be a mystery to us. Apartment 407, right next to us, appeared to house someone. We'd often hear footsteps in the corridor, and the sound of the door opening and closing. But by the time we'd peek through our peephole, there would be no one there. One evening, while Clara was trying out a new recipe in our kitchen, an eerie moaning echoed from 407. It sounded like a blend of pain and sorrow, a sound that really gave us the chills. Concerned for our unseen neighbor, I decided to check on him. Stepping out, I knocked on the door. As soon as my knuckles made contact, the moaning stopped. I waited, feeling the weight of the silence, but no answer came. Hello? I said. Is everything okay? There was no response. Days passed, and the events of that evening weighed on my mind. Clara and I would at times press our ears up against the wall, and would hear footsteps and mumbling coming from the next apartment over. Trying to shake everything off, we focused on settling into our new life. We frequented the gym, dined at the nearby gourmet restaurants, and spent lazy afternoons by the complex's nice pool. One evening, as we lounged by that pool, Clara suddenly tapped me on my leg. Look, she whispered, discreetly motioning with her head upwards. Following her gaze, I saw a shadowy figure standing behind the sheer curtain of apartment 407. But in the blink of an eye, it disappeared. The sight was so fleeting that I would have dismissed it as a trick of the light had Clara not seen it too. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I decided to speak with the apartment manager, Mrs. Patterson. She was a sweet woman in her fifties, with silver streaks in her hair and a perpetual warm smile. Upon inquiring about the tenant of 407, her expression turned from one of casual interest to confusion. No one's been living in 407 for several weeks, she said her voice laced with genuine surprise. I relayed our strange experiences to her, the sounds, the silhouette, the eerie moaning. Mrs. Patterson, now visibly concerned, decided to accompany me to the apartment. As we approached the wooden door of 407, those all too familiar murmurs met our ears. Mrs. Patterson hesitated, then knocked. Instantly the sounds ceased. She knocked again. Nothing. No sounds and no answer. With a heightened look of confusion on her face, she unlocked the door. The apartment was a stark contrast to ours. While our unit was filled with life, love, and warmth, 407 was cold and desolate. There was nothing there. No furniture, no belongings, and no person. Just a single sheer curtain covering the living room window. There was no sign of recent occupancy at all. Mrs. Patterson, her face pale, relayed the tragic history of the apartment. Mr. Applegate, a solitary elderly man, had been its tenant for years. Known for his reclusive habits, he rarely ventured out. Tragically, he had suffered a fatal fall in the apartment. It appeared that he had tripped, his head taking a blow on the counter before coming to rest on the floor. His agonized moans eventually alerted a neighbor down the hall, but help arrived too late, and Mr. Applegate passed away right there, before the ambulance could arrive. These events, she said, happened about three weeks before we moved in. The weight of what Mrs. Patterson was telling me was immense. How could this be? The sounds, the footsteps, the moans. Someone had to be in that apartment, but there was no one. As I later relayed the revelation to Clara, I could see the blood run out of her face. That's impossible, she said. We're always hearing noises from that apartment. I know, I said back to her. But the manager told me that there's been no one in that apartment for weeks, not since Mr. Applegate died. 
deciding that this was a little bit too much for us to handle, we requested to be moved to a different room and floor. Mrs. Patterson, out of the kindness of her heart, accepted and moved us to the sixth floor. Life has resumed its rhythm in our new space. No noises, no footsteps, no murmurs or moans. Sometimes, though, while enjoying the sunset by the pool, Clara and I find our eyes drifting up to that window. Every so often, I swear, you can still catch a glimpse of someone walking around. In apartment 407, Thanks for tuning in to another episode from the Alley of Nightmares. If you enjoyed the video, please like it, subscribe, and share with all your friends. Until next time... <laughs>